To make the videos for this channel in the last couple of years, I've used a classic engineer's computer, a Hewlett Packard ZBook. But time moves on, so I've moved on to a new MacBook Pro. How did that work out? Well, stick around and find out. Whoa. Now, I'm not a tech reviewer. I don't go through a new computer every couple of months and compare the latest greatest with the best of last season. I've been using the second-hand 2013 HP ZBook for the last six years. It created over 100 videos for my channel. However, it is a bit limiting, as it takes about 90 minutes to render out a 15-minute video and was also not powerful enough to scrub through the timeline without st a stuttering slideshow, especially when doing fast-forward, which I do a lot, or if I layer some titles and special effects. I got kind of a the standard model, but with an extra upgrade of the hard drive. I figured with video I'm going to need a fair bit of hard drive. It finally got to the point where the benefits of upgrading won out. They certainly wrapped this stuff nicely. I would have preferred to have remained in the Windows ecosystem, but over the last decade open source software has gotten better and better. And when I took stock, I was not really locked into any Windows specific applications. There, as I discussed in my analysis paralysis video, link up the top, I took a really close look at getting an M1 MacBook Air. Apple's ARM-based silicon is obviously extremely well optimized for video editing. And since my primary use case for upgrading is editing, it became clear that an M1 MacBook had to be considered. And it was always going to be a laptop. While I might do 80% of my editing at my desk, I do enough travel that when I need to edit at airports, planes, and hotel rooms, I need a laptop. While the MacBook Air could well be enough computer for my existing video editing, the 13-inch monitor and the cost of upgrading the small baseline storage and lack of ports seemed like it'd be difficult to live with. Now, when I put out my video showing my old setup, I got a lot of very generous support from Patreons and donations and was able to take a step back and a broader look at my options for a computer that should last me for the next five years or more. My first computing experience was with the Apple IIe from my high school. Rather than learning everything about the machine hardware and programming, unfortunately, I spent all my time playing Load Runner and Wizardry. I think I still have the muscle memory to cast Tilterweight. Thinking back, when you consider that we could become so absorbed in the primitive graphics of Wizardry to be startled when attacked, it shows how much of gaming occurs in the imagination rather than in graphics. And if you doubt that, try reading a book. After two years of doing videos, I'm committed to DaVinci Resolve. This program is very broad and deep in scope and power, so it takes that long to learn it and to develop the muscle memory to edit reasonably fast. While I could also learn Premiere or Final Cut Pro, there seems to be enough migration from those programs to Resolve to indicate that it is as good or better than the competition. The online recommendations all point to Resolve needing an 8GB graphic card to edit 4K video smoothly in Windows. While I've not yet made the switch to shooting everything in 4K, I do intend to, even if it's only to output better 1080p or 1440p timelines. It could be that the 8GB recommendation is overkill and a more limited GPU would work fine, but I don't really want to fork over a grand to find out that it's an unsatisfactory editing experience again. And once I broadened the scope of what I would invest in this, the choice basically came down between the M1 MacBook Pro and a Razorblade 15 Advanced. The MacBook Pro won out by virtue of the power management and thermals, the optimization for video and being cheaper. Who thought that could be said about Apple? The baseline MacBook Pro 14 with the 8 core CPU, 14 core GPU, which has like some crippled cores, is probably indistinguishable in performance for what I do, but I forked out the extra 200 for the 10 core, 16 core version. The upgrade to the one terabyte onboard SSD is expensive, but my current workflow is to have all the clips for this week's video on board and archive them all off each week, so I figured I needed the space. When it comes to normal stuff, like surfing the web, watching videos, using the productivity programs like email, word processors, spreadsheets, or making a presentation, any halfway decent computer of the last decade works fine. For all this stuff, there's barely any noticeable performance difference as they are not performance limited. However, where there is a noticeable difference for me is the way OS X handles the transition to and from sleep mode. On the ZBook, I would carry it to another room with it open because if I closed the lid and put it to sleep, it would take 30 seconds or more to wake up and be logged back in. OS X is up before the lid is even finished opening and the Touch ID is nearly immediate. I really like that. 
I haven't done much CAD modeling with it yet, and no complex assemblies, but FreeCAD and QElectroTech both load quickly and provide a nice fluid, stable environment. But let's talk about video editing, because this is what I got it for. And, spoiler, it delivers. Does it speed up the editing? Sort of, but not really. Just like a faster computer won't let you write a novel faster, the creative process of video editing takes time. I do think it helps me to make better videos though. When editing, I can now see the effect of fast forward motion in real time and can optimize it. On the ZBook, I could only see it when it was rendered out. I can also see how the stack of titles, effects, etc. will look when edited. That really helps. Because rendering out a finished video took like at least 90 minutes on the ZBook, I'd edit the whole video, render it once, watch it, fix obvious mistakes, render it again, and then upload it. To hit my self-imposed upload deadlines, there really wasn't time for more. So far, I've edited four of my typical videos on the MacBook Pro, and it renders out my content between 30 and 45 times faster, sort of two to three minutes instead of 70 to 100 minutes for a video. This hardware is an incredibly impressive bit of manufacturing technology. From the untold numbers of reviews that I watched, I had high expectations for the hardware. While not heavy in absolute terms, it does feel very dense and rigid. I mean, the ZBook was also very well built, but not at the level of the MacBook Pro. The card reader seems a bit flaky. Sometimes it doesn't mount. Still, it's there and I need it. Although like Linux, iOS 6 seems to have a fit if you rip the card out without unmounting it first. I know you can also corrupt data in Windows if you don't first unmount it, but I don't want to be nagged about it all the time. Let's talk about power management or battery. This is one of the absolute hype points of this machine. I got the uprated 90 watt charger for it, but sometimes wonder if it was worth the extra weight to carry around. I really can't imagine the need for faster charging other than maybe the airport between flights. Although ever more airline seats have USB power anyway. The MacBook Pro runs forever when surfing and five or six hours when video editing. One time I did plug it into one of these USB 3 ports and I was surfing the web and after about 90 minutes it had only gained about 5% extra charge and I thought man that's crappy performance considering this thing outputs 60 watts of power. Turned out the port was only 15 watts, about like a phone charger. So for surfing this thing will keep running and even charge on a really weak charger. I'm sure you could trickle charge it overnight with just your phone charger if you needed to. So the 60 watts from the Thunderport dock when plugged into the correct port is plenty. When I switch from the MacBook to my work HP on that same dock, it gives me a warning that it's a low powered charger. It still works, but on the MacBook it charges much faster. Closely associated with the power efficiency is the thermal performance. The ZBook got really hot when editing or rendering video. It's too uncomfortable to have it on your lap and edit. The MacBook Pro has so far never gotten warm to the point I noticed it, although so far I've only used it in winter. The ZBook also cranked the fans to 11 when rendering out video and sounded like it was screaming for help. I have noticed the fans come on on the MacBook Pro, but only during rendering and only because I was checking for it. The 14-inch MacBook Pro is also significantly smaller than the 14-inch ZBook. The display bezels are much thinner, which allow the reduction in two dimensions, and it's also a bit thinner. As the overall size of the ZBook is about halfway between the size of the 14-inch and the 16-inch MacBook Pros, I did consider moving up to the larger one, which would have had advantages for video editing, but I chose portability. In comparison, the display is really nice, but you don't really notice the improvement after the first usage. I don't color calibrate, as it's mostly used indoors, it's generally between a half and two thirds brightness setting. It's a nice display, but the improvement leaves little impression versus a normal 1080p IPA panel. It's kind of sad, huh? Our expectations just reset immediately. I barely notice the notch, it's not worth talking about. Having OS X set up to auto hide the menu at the top and bottom is a logical setup for me, but then I often get the top menu appearing just as I try and select something in Resolve's menu, and that can be a little annoying. I quite often read articles online, and I have noticed a minor weird behavior which no other reviewer seems to have noticed. When you scroll a page of text with a two finger swipe, after it stops, about a half a second later, there's a little jiggle. It's quite consistent. I'm guessing it has to do with the display driver switching from the high refresh rate back to normal once the motion stops. It can be a little annoying when reading a lot, but it's not a big deal. In contrast with the display improvement, where you kind of don't notice it after using it for a few minutes, the speakers really impress. This machine sounds excellent with a really balanced response, even into the bass. 
Reviewers say that the 16 inch MacBook Pro is even a step up from this, but man, this is already brilliant. Since teleworking has been going on for over two years, and is going to be a fixture in my future. I splashed out on the monitor, Thunderbolt hub, and a decent mouse and keyboard from Logitech, not only for my editing, but also so I can dock my work elite book through USB-C. As the Dell monitor I got supports connection through USB-C, I got a high-end CalDigit Thunderbolt 4 hub to act as a docking station. Generally, I keep the USB dongles for my Logitech mouse and keyboard connected there. The Contour Shuttle Pro, which I only use for video editing, stays plugged into the USB port on the monitor. The Shuttle driver for OS X seems a bit weird to me, but that could also be an issue with DaVinci Resolve, which is also a bit weird in the way you set up shortcuts. But after a couple of tries, I got it configured the way I like it. I use a Focusrite Solo audio interface for my voice over microphone and speakers. The Focusrite can't be run through that CalDigit Thunderbolt hub because you get hissing and digital noise. In fact, I'm plugged into it now and it sounds normal, so weird. You just have to trust me. Normally I get digital interference spoiling the audio. So my desktop setup needs two cables. The Thunderbolt 4 into the hub, plus an extra USB-C directly from the audio interface to the MacBook. Maybe it's just the cable, but I notice if I move the MacBook Pro, the audio will sometimes reset from external to, the, uh, to its own speakers. It's very sensitive there. The MX3 mouse is unusually heavy, but works well with OS X. I do like the undo, redo buttons under your thumb and the gesture button. But you know, the thing I bought it for, the side zoom wheel, so far, I've not been able to get that patched into DaVinci Resolve at all. All reviewers seem to rave about Apple touchpads. I mean, it works well, but seems to me so do the ones from Hewlett Packard on my work computer. And the gestures seem to work pretty similar. Also, reviewers seem to rave about the Apple keyboard. I'm not a great typist, so for me, it's fine, but doesn't seem to make any difference. I find the Logitech MX keys also feel somewhat similar, although the keys do have a bit more travel. It feels very heavy and solid. I think they probably put a steel bar inside it somewhere just to give it that feeling of mass. The main cool feature of this Logitech MX keyboard and mouse, well, I can't even use it. That's where you can seamlessly travel between screens on different computers and even different OSs, but because I can't install software on my work computer, I can't use it. I expected it to be cool that this MX Keys has both Apple and Windows symbols on keys like the Command and Alt and those sorts of things. What I didn't notice is just how weird some of the other symbol layouts are on this thing. So not sure it was a good idea to buy the MX Keys, especially at the same time as switching from one operating system to another. Since I switch back and forth between different operating systems, I reverse the behavior of the function and command keys on my MacBook Pro. As my muscle memory is to use my pinky to hit control and my X, C and V for the cut, copy, paste, OS X lets you reverse the scroll direction of the pointing device to make it more natural on the touchpad. I'm not sure what imaginary problem Apple was trying to solve there, because this is not an issue on Linux or Windows. You can have it either way. The dumb thing is that setting is also applied to the mouse. So although there are two different tabs, you can't separate the behavior. So either it feels wrong on the mouse or wrong on the touchpad. Luckily, there's an app which you can install to reverse it on the mouse. So I did that. This would not be a Windows to Apple migration without having a bit of a rant. So what's the weird Apple shit that I hate? I think the main one is the inconsistent cut-paste behavior. Text can be cut-paste with the typical hotkeys, Control X, Control V, or Command, until I switch them. But files have no cut-paste. You can copy and then do extra finger gymnastics to make the paste into a move. Oh well, that is Apple standard, you might say. But remember, OS X is like a port of Linux or Unix, and Linux has a cut paste for files, so Apple must have deliberately removed that. In general, I think OS X overdoes the finger gymnastics. I use the clipping tool a lot, and having it integrated into OS X is good, but needing Shift Option Command plus four seems a little excessive for a hotkey. The next thing that bugs me is that I do a lot of screen recording in my video work and OS X's integration of this into the QuickTime player with the ability to start it with Command Shift 5, that's good. But the screen recorder can't record internal audio. What? Who thought that was a good idea? So now you have to go out on the internet, search for an app widget to fix that and end up installing Blacklist. Hooray! Now screen recording works, including the internal audio. But wait a minute. Now the automatic switching between speakers, external audio, and headsets seems broken. Hooroo. To have the internal audio screen recording means I have to select headset audio when I plug them in. 
and that sucks. That should be automatic. In general, I'd say everything needs more clicks in OS X. If you go from one screen to another and click on something, it normally does nothing as that first click just sets the focus. And I also find the missing delete key to be pretty annoying. I know you can do this with command back, but this seems basic on pretty much all other keyboards these days, so being different for different sake is just annoying. I know all window users are supposed to crap on OS X for not having a face ID to unlock the machine, but since I never had that set up on a Windows machine and I was constantly typing in my password, I really like the finger ID feature. But hey, despite those minor annoyances, I am really satisfied with this laptop. It does exactly what I need it to do really, really well. I got it as a video editing tool and it does that fantastically. The hardware is seriously impressive especially the power efficiency and the thermals, and also the sound. I guess those are the, the three main things for me. On the other hand, I don't really understand some of the sort of product worship of the Apple system, as I feel OS X is the aspect of this machine I could probably live without fine. There are nice to haves like the quick wake up, but also some annoying clunky aspects. Now for the sort of video editing that I do, I am glad that I wasn't seduced into forking out more money for the M1 Max, as the performance difference is probably unlikely to be significant for my kind of content. For the price of the MacBook Pro, today I could also get a Mac Studio Max, but I wouldn't have done that even if the Studio had been out when I got this. I need a laptop, and I doubt that the power of the Studio Max makes a significant difference in what I do. It looks like a lot of software is going to need to be rewritten to really push the limits of like the Max or especially the Ultra. It will be interesting to see where Microsoft goes with ARM support for Windows, as at the moment needing 150 watt GPUs and the heat that they generate just doesn't seem like an attractive way forward for mobile computing. Now if you like this video, don't bother subscribing because I'm not a tech review channel, so this is not what I do. Like and subscribe might just confuse the algorithm. But if you hated this video, give it two thumbs down, give it heaps. Thanks for watching.